I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is Dr. Susan Schwartz, a Jungian analyst and clinical psychologist based in Arizona. As a member of the International Association of Analytical Psychology, she has taught and presented at conferences and workshops in the United States and worldwide. She has several articles and book chapters on these aspects of Jungian psychology. She's here to talk about her new book, The Absent Father Effect on Daughters, published by Rutledge. For more, you can visit her website, susanschwartzphd.com. That's S-U-S-A-N-S-C-H-W-A-R-T-Z-P-H-D.com. As with all Rendering Unconscious podcast episodes, there is a video accompanying this episode at YouTube. Just visit Trapart Films' YouTube channel, that's T-R-A-P-A-R-T Film at YouTube, or search for Rendering Unconscious Podcast. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. You can visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net, or the podcast main website, renderingunconscious.org, for links and more information. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at rawsin underscore. That's R-A-W-S-I-N underscore. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. From Tripart Books 2019. For more information, you can visit our publisher's website, trapart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You can support the podcast at our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Vanessa23Carl. That's V-A-N-E-S-S-A 2-3-C-A-R-L. Your support is very appreciated. Thank you so much for supporting Rendering Unconscious Podcast and all of my other creative endeavors. Well, I oftentimes, and thank you very much, Vanessa, for having me. I totally appreciate it. I oftentimes am asked why a book, what, oh, let me put it this way. Why another book on fathers? So the last person who asked me this, who was actually a Jungian analyst, said there already have been three. (laughs) But that three since 1988. That's not many. Not many, exactly. (laughs) So my answer is another? Wouldn't it be obvious? But you see, I think actually the question represented something beyond Jungian work, which is psychoanalysis in general, psychology in general, just in general, what about the father? Where has he been in our lives? And where has his responsibility been to connect with his daughter? If we look back at the history of Freud with his father, Jung, with his father, the connection was very disappointing. Betrayal, distance, spiritual, bereft. And Jung had four daughters. He did not write about his daughters or the daughter or what is called in Jungian psychology, the puella, which would be the girl No, he didn't write about that. Few followers have. So I think what I'm speaking about is the dearth of attention to fathers and daughters all over the place until maybe 25 years ago in the psychological psychoanalytic world, 
there was very little attention on fathers and their roles. When you read case studies, where was the father? Well, he's not mentioned. So what I noted, not just because of the literature, but people who sit in my office, women, I will ask them where, they will go on about their mothers and I will always say, where was your father? Either I get, he was there when I was little, we played when I was little, and then something drops off. It drops off oftentimes, even before puberty, where the father gets uncomfortable with his developing daughter, that's kind of classic. But it's deeper than that. He doesn't know how to relate to her. She learns very early to expect nothing. And so her response is, to my question, where was he? She actually doesn't know. And from that, not knowing, not even realizing he should be there. He, he should have known to be there. She shouldn't have had to ask him or beg him to come to her soccer games, etc. He should have known, but you know, he didn't. You see, that's the other side. Where was his father? Where was the mother partnering with the father and how much did she expect and want him to be there? So now we've got another layer. Where was she in relation to her father? Another layer. So we've got absence, 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 and more absence. And I felt somebody ought to say something. And so that's how it evolved. You know, that's great. And it's a really good point thinking, like you're saying, personally, I'm thinking of all sorts of examples and then like uh, clinically and then also theoretically, like, like you said, there's not really much about fathers and daughters. And even like with Boyd and Young, you know, even the early times of psychoanalysis, it's more about if there is, a, it's about the father, it's about the father and the son and their relationship. And then, of course, about the mother and the son, but not much about uh, daughters at all. No. And, and uh, historically, daughters have been like property. So the, the daughter is sold to so-and-so. I'm being facetious a little bit. Um, in order to get something for the father or for the family. We don't know what she ever gets. And I think she's been very forgotten to the point where she forgets about herself. One woman said, well, on her block and in her neighborhood, nobody had a father. So she didn't even know to miss a father because she didn't have a father. Another one says, well, you know, I had my mother. I didn't have a father, so I was glad because now I had my mother to myself. So these are rationalizations of how to deal with absence and lack. Let me also say, I think in our era, we have to be aware to not be, well, all eras, but I think we should be aware now as well. Watch out for the stereotypes. So I say father, I mean somebody who is in a fathering position. Mother, someone who's in a mothering position. Both of them are to be, whoever they are, caregivers, nurturers, lovers, appropriately, uh, psychologically aware of their children, participants. They haven't been. So the education of fathers culturally has also been lacking yeah absolutely i often think about until very recently how often all parents were basically very young <laughs> as well you know parents throughout time have um, been very young and then had kids when they were pretty young and then they had kids when they were pretty young and it's only in like the re recent past like century that people have started having kids a little bit older and like doing more things when they're in their 20s, for example, things like that. I, I agree with you. And, and I do think that you're saying kind of what I'm saying as well, is that there's a transgenerational passage on 
of how people are, we, we know this, how you're treated is how you're going to treat other people until you start being conscious and aware. And of course that is a whole process to go into being conscious and aware. One of the things that has struck me is that in the last X amount of time, many people who are, you could say 60s, 70s, 80s, they want to, excuse me, they want to find out about what happened to their father in their life. So they have lived all these years kind of rationalizing something and now they realize I have to figure it out. I, I think it's quite interesting and, and actually a very important move to be able to say, you know, I missed something here and I need to recover it. I think there's something very hopeful in that. It's like, you know, you're never too old. So fill in the gaps. The, the other thing I would say is that, and, and I don't know if you're familiar with Andre Green. Yeah, okay. So Andre Green writes about the, because I read a little bit about you as well. And so I thought you probably knew some of his work. And why I appreciate it is that it fits a bit with Jung's negative father complex, you could say, but he, he goes into it quite differently. And the absent father is, and I attribute it to Andre Green's, the, the dead mother effect. It, it's it's a, the sense of absence, the emptiness, the lack, but when he talks about it, it's not just a place of not there, it's a place of not there to fill. And that's what I think awareness is and our responsibility. So if you have the absence of the father, how will you fill it in your life? And I think that is incredibly important and most people don't know how to do it or they will say, I have a negative father complex. Oh, what does that mean? What do you do with it? Do you continue hating yourself in your life? Always in lack, never good enough, not this enough, not, not too thin, it, too, too, not fat, thin enough, not young enough, not beautiful enough, not, not, not. All of these absences or negatives actually come about partly because a father wasn't there to give good feedback. So I'm, I'm kind of reaching over different analytic traditions because I think there's something about uniting them together that is, they're not the same, but they have a, a similar intent towards awareness and feeling what we haven't had. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like, you know, it's great to be eclectic and kind of uh, integrate different parts of different theories, because it, it fits with different people, like different clients or patients you might see, you might see like, okay, this is this is reminding me of something very Kleinian, and this is something very Jungian. And it's great to be able to pull from all these different theorists in, in clinical work and theoretical work. Yes, because I think it expands ourselves. And we are also then not caught in that classical father stereotype tradition. So I, so we don't want to just follow, say, Jung the father, whatever that means, or Freud the father, or Lacan the father. Mm -hmm. But how, wh where are, where is the feminine, and how do they come together? Again, I think that the amount that the daughter has gone unacknowledged, her important place in a family, how she's been in secret, the incest has also gone in secret. That could be psychological incest, actual incest, the keep quiet, support the father, make sure he's happy, take away his depression, much of that is non-verbally laid on to the daughter. Mm -hmm. One other thing I wanted to say too, which is that 
the importance of the father from the very beginning, the absolute beginning, before the baby is born, the, the involvement in a mutual way is, it's important. We feel it in utero if there's a presence. And then as we grow, we want to have the gaze of the father, his eyes, we would like him to see us. But if he isn't there, he doesn't see us. And then he also, I think, has an effect on our own physical selves, our body image. Whether he says anything or doesn't say anything. Mm -hmm. I, I think, and that also is something I think has not been very much addressed, is the influence of the father on how a daughter feels about her own physical self and if she feels good about herself. And I have found that many, no matter how they look, I'm sure you have as well, no matter how they look, it's not enough. And does that come from having lacked an appropriate mirroring from the father figure? It's a really good point. Yeah, I, I wanted to go back to one thing you had said about the, um, the parents, parents before many generations ago who were quite a bit younger and this kind of um, how the world was different, eclectic nature of how we draw things together, but that also includes culture. And I think that the honoring of each culture is incredibly important because if we know ours, do we know how the father and daughter were in that person's culture? How did they get raised? What did they feel there? Even within the same country, like I had referred to this person I had spoken to who took it for granted that nobody had any fathers because no one had fathers on their block. Mm -hmm. so that was their culture within the United States. So it's within this country, my country, but it, it's also a culture that needs to be gone into. And well, how was it really in the culture you were raised in? So I think there's something about respecting all the differences that are there and honoring them. It, it makes the psyche much more vibrant. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it even seems like, like an absence of fathers, like kind of culturally, like in the larger culture as well. Um, yeah, culturally, I think there is an absence of fathers, for sure. We could look at it in all kinds of professions, in politics, in, in the relatedness, also, of course, the absence of women. So how did the women, I have to read one thing because I, as I was looking, um, just looking through my notes, I came across something from Helene Cizo who wrote a book called Inside and it's about her father. And her father died when she was quite young. So here's an absence of a father, but she actually loved him. Now she was very young when he died, so who knows what would have happened. But this is what she writes about the father. It's just a short sentence, but it really says quite a bit. It says, I am in the father whom I carry. He haunts me. I live him. So it's a very like, I'm in him, he's in me. And if that's true, who am I living? Am I living the father's image of the daughter? Am I living his image of me? Am I living my image of him? So it, it's a very, how do we differentiate all of these? And I think it takes a lot of analytic work to really go into all the layers. Exactly. And how are they all playing out? Him, my imagined him image that he has of me and the projected image he's putting on me or my imagined image of him that I'm taking on. Um, yes. But I also think that many daughters do not feel free 
to ask their fathers those very questions or to even talk to their fathers about where were you. I also don't know if the fathers know how to answer. You know, I mean, I, um, because a lot of them don't have words. A lot of them, I'll give you an example. You know this example because it's just classic. Someone that I was speaking to just yesterday, a father was talking about how he relates to his daughter. And he said, well, you know, we do stuff. We don't really talk about anything. I said, really? Why don't you talk about how you feel, your emotions, how you feel about her, how she feels about you. Did you ever ask her? No. Did you ever think to ask her? Well, that's not a guy thing. I said, I'm not sure it's not a guy thing. You see, look at the stereotypes and the ideas that people still carry, denying themselves. I mean, the statement was very sad to me mm -hmm. because I felt, oh, I said, you know, you're denying yourself of the richness of a life with your daughter and she might need you to open it up. Yeah. I think it's up to some fathers to open the conversation. One of the things that I emphasize actually in my book and when I talk about this is the betrayal of the father but it's also that he's betraying himself. Mm -hmm. I, that's in my example. He's betraying himself from his own depth and his own knowledge. And then of course he's betraying her. So I think it's something that uh, it's not easy to look at. I'm sure you find this as well. We come up against a pretty strong resistance from going there. Daughters learn to be very protective of their fathers. Yeah, absolutely. No, and this idea of masculinity, it's exactly that. It, it's not good for anyone, including the men. Um, for sure. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Virginia Woolf. Uh, uh, yes, okay. She, she writes quite well, beautifully. But in addition to that, she writes something about her father, that's a very sad story because actually uh, when her mother died, she and I think her sister, because they were the daughters, were supposed to make the father less depressed. It's not that he said anything. He just could look a certain way. She describes this. So, and you can just feel it. He would look a certain way. She would then come towards him try to make him feel better. And she knew that she had to. It's not that anybody told her verbally, but she knew she had to. She knew he needed her to give to him emotionally. The betrayal is he was not giving to her. How it affected her in her life, I don't know. But I think it was a very it's very poignant the way she wrote about that and how many daughters quite learn to just obviate it all and jump over it. And, oh, that's what I did. I excused him. I think it's not healthy for anybody. Now, you definitely see all the time in clinical practice how much, and like you're saying, it's not like mothers and daughters and mothers and fathers sit their girls down and they tell them like this is your role in society and you have to take care of people and do all this emotional labor and make sure that your father is happy and bend yourself so that everyone else is comfortable but you see it all the time in clinical work when people come in like as young adults in their 20s or something and these young women are always kind of like just like self-effacing and and always bending over backwards to make everybody else comfortable and really not taking care of their own needs a lot of times well i will agree with you you just said it young women so i don't know how old young women are <laughs> but i think we have this fantasy that in fact whatever whatever the newer generations are whatever that means that somehow they're more liberated well, I haven't found it. It's just like what you're saying. Sadly, I haven't found it. On the 
other hand, I would say, like I said a bit earlier, someone that I worked with a while ago who was in their 70s had had, so this relates to the father, a very distant, this is just a, an example, but one that's generalizable, that had had a recurrent dream on and off for 40 years, 40 years on and off. And in it, the man was like the first love and he wasn't a good guy for like a long-term story. He, he just wasn't. But she always wanted him for all these years. It was as if she had learned to not be wanted. And she had a very disciplinarian, distant father. So through our work together, I remember one day she said, well, I had my old dream. But in this dream, I realized he wasn't the right guy to be with. I didn't want to be with him. He's not correct. He doesn't treat me well enough. And I turned around and left. And it had taken her these years to figure out that in fact, she could be herself and she doesn't have to be with a bad guy. Maybe when you're way younger, whatever that means, you're still not ready to accept somebody who's really with you. I think that's our work as analysts is to do that. And I don't know if you have found this, but I've not, it's not been unusual for me to get the father projection onto me. I mean, I, when, I mean, when we used to have people who came to our offices, I would always say, he, he came in the door today, didn't he? Because you could just feel the, the energy. It oftentimes was not very good, but I was always appreciative that he had appeared even though it was projected onto me and it was not, it wasn't wonderful at all, but at least he was there and then he could be worked with. And I think that's another issue that doesn't get addressed is the projection onto the woman therapist or analyst of the father. I mean, we read about the projection onto the male therapist or analyst as the mother, but we don't read too much of the other. It's part of this. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. No, and like yeah. you said, the work of announcers, it's, it's ongoing. That's why I always think of it as a process that like once it gets like started, even once you leave your actual analyst eventually after however many years, you know, it's still something that stays with you and you keep kind of going through layers and it's everything so pervasive. Um, but I remember like I've had three analyses and I remember in my second one was when I realized like my whole first analysis had been about my mother and then like partway through my second one, I remember all of a sudden realizing, oh, I have all these feelings about my dad too. <laughs> but I had been like so focused on my mom that he was even the absence from my analysis, you know? But, but you see, I, exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, that's not uncommon. He's so absent from the story inside that he's absent from the analysis. And, and then everything gets put on to the mother. It's, it's kind of a short shrift to her. Mm. She gets all the, uh, and the feminine as well gets trashed a bit and the maternal trashed. And where's the paternal? It's so under there that look at all the time it takes. Mm. And you were in yes. it. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and so many other people aren't going to devote and don't think about devoting years to figuring it out, but it's under all those layers. That's, that's what I think as well. That's why I gave that example of that woman who had that dream for 40 years. And finally, she was able to go, wait a second. No, I can tell, wrong guy. Wrong guy inside was the issue. I mean, it was how she was carrying herself inside, which was, not very confident 
See, and this is where I think the absence uh, of the father affects the daughter, confidence, um, a certain sense of solidity. Someone said to me, well, do you think that if you have an absent father, you're gonna have bad relationships and life will be chaotic. And so all this outer kind of distress, mm. I think that's true. I think it's also more subtle or additionally subtle that there can be people who look very successful, they do well, there's cracks in the story and they really have a hard time getting into it. So it's, um, it, it, it functions, the absence functions in subtle and not so subtle ways. I think it's easy when you say, oh yeah, she didn't have a father, therefore her grades are low. No, I don't think, it's not that simple. Too simplistic, yeah. It's too simplistic. And so I really feel like the issue is many layered. And so when someone will ask, like, like you and I are talking, why even talk about this? Because it's been so much buried for years that, I mean, what else are we going to talk about? I mean, many things, but also where has he been? Yeah, no, it's a really good point. It's not something that's talked about. It's not talked about in psychoanalytic theory much at all. I can't even think of anything when I'm trying to think of like where I've really read about, really read about it. And I can't really think of anything except for your book. Well, I was trying to think as well, because um, I always try to think about it. But well, not just about this, but you know, when, when you're an analyst, you just analyze, it's just kind of part of the story. And I right? apologize to my husband all the time. <laughs> When I start analyzing something he's doing, I'm like, I'm sorry. And he's like, no, I love it. I'm like, okay, good. I can't, I can't help it. <laughs> but, you see, but you see, so I don't apologize to mine. He just accepts it. Okay, and accepts good. It. I hope to get there. <laughs> but you know, I think that also what you're saying about yours is he's the kind of person who is open to the psyche. Yeah, mine is as well, which I totally appreciate. Because I think it's like, go into it, go into it, go into it. But um, so much not discussed, even when you talk, not you, but even as we mentioned Freud, well, his daughter, Anna, was just very bright. I mean, but you kind of wonder, did she have to sacrifice something to serve her father? I mean... Jung would have had to sacrifice to stay with him. So what did she sacrifice? Who knows? I mean, yeah, I'm sure. Absolutely. I remember I was teaching a few years ago and I, I remember having the realization, like, no wonder her uh, theories of analysis were all about like psychic defenses <laughs> because like her dad analyzed her. You know, it's like, so of course you're going to be like, it's all about shoring up your ego and building all these defensives <laughs> to protect yourself. <laughs> I think you're right. I mean, of course, you know, it's always interesting to look back at people who they, they can't say anything at this moment. But I always wondered, what is the cost? Not, not just to Anna Freud, but to women who are in the position. She had to put his prosthetic mouth in every day and so the talk about a sexual move I mean it was just so huge and I think a lot of daughters carry something very huge that they almost don't even realize and build up a huge amount of defenses against that I, I want to give um, I don't know if you know about this person um, Ingrid Yonkers she, very interesting woman poet in South Africa. And there is a quite a lovely film, not, not happy, called Black Butterflies. And it really shows the daughter and father. But this is the father who's a really 
He is a harsh, brutal, mean, absent, abandoning father. Why I mention her is that the movie is, is very intriguing, but she wrote a poem that Nelson Mandela, you could say the father of South Africa in a way, or the new South Africa. She wrote a poem called The Child Who Was Shot Dead. Mm -hmm. And it is about the, I'm just going to read a titch of it. It says, the child raises his fists against his father in the march of the generations who scream Africa, scream the smell of justice and blood. So even though it is written and he read it at his first inauguration, mm -hmm. I mean, it's very powerful that she would, her poem would have been chosen for him to read. Her father, upon hearing that she had drowned in the, killed herself by drowning in the ocean. Mm -hmm. This is what her father says. He says, they can throw her back into the sea for all I care. It's horrible. And, and I say that because the, you know, when things are extreme, you can really go back from it and say, it was this bad. Some people live it this bad. They don't even realize it, some of them, to defend it, or some realize it and don't know they can talk about it. And so I think that our roles of believing the horrors that are there actually help people get into their reality and know it was reality. Sad and very difficult, but real, yeah. Yeah, exactly. No, and I think a lot, a lot is much worse than people like to realize. Like, for example, like you said, like uh, with incest and, you know, of course, early Ford was, he was speaking about that as well. And then kind of changed it to like, oh, maybe it's a fantasy, but it's like, no, actually, there's a lot of sexual abuse happening, <laughs> actually. <laughs> actually, there is. And to corroborate it, when, when, who does the daughter tell? Well, you know this. There's nobody to tell. They try to tell, but then the people say, "Well, no, no, your your parents look fine," or or he brings in the money, or you have a roof over your head, or whatever other thing they're going to do, and they don't get it corroborated. Or the other very sad thing is if the daughter gets taken away from the family and has to go to a worse place, where then she's abused again, mm -hmm. which actually happens far too often. No, I agree with you. I think that the, the whole issue of abuse as well is certainly a part of the absent father, because of course the absence I'm talking about is physical, but also emotional. And the abusive piece is in there as well. Um, but I think people can be abused, certainly physically, it's awful, but also through the look. So some daughters have described this awful lecherous look or, mm -hmm. or the comments uh, watching the internet or YouTube or television, very creepy, just, just slimy. And you know, they thought they were supposed to accept it. And the fact that they tell us in our offices I think helps release them from it. So in a certain way, there really is an effect when you've had really a horrifying, horrifying father. And that might be, you've got very distant relationships but to others, but also to oneself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then of course, a lot of people kind of date their parent type over and over again you know like trying to kind of repair the relationship with the father she might find herself or he might find himself in in relation with the person that's very similar over and over again um usually i think you're right that's what happens a, a very similar kind of personality that they don't realize at the beginning and then there it is it, it's like 
it kind of unravels. But you could also say, is that something that that daughter is trying to figure out by repeating the story? So the repetition of it is almost insisting, figure this story out. It's not pretty, but figure it out because it's affected your life. I think a lot of people don't even realize how much this has affected their lives. And there's another thing I thought you were going to say, so I have to add on. I thought you were going to say, because so many people say, not you, but so many people say, forgive him. Mm. Forgive him. Really? With, without him doing the work, forgive him. And then, of course, the other side is, well, he's dead now. I'll forgive him. Is that the right reason to forgive? And does that help psychologically anybody if you just forgive somebody for being horrendous? The work isn't done. Yeah, exactly. What does that even mean if you're not, if you haven't actually worked through it? What does it mean? But you see, it's bandied about a great deal. I agree. Oh, with yeah. You. Uh, what is it? <laughs> you know, I, I oftentimes, I'll, you, I'm sure you hear this in your office as well. You know, I'll forgive him. I'm always questioning, why are you forgiving him? For what are you forgiving him? Well, it, well, and then I can move on. No, you won't. You won't move on. There's a little bit of a, it's a resistance. It's also resistance against leaving him and knowing you'll never have what you wanted. Never. You won't get it. You got to find him inside. You got to find the support and protection and love and everything that you wanted from him inside of yourself. So I would add on the things that I don't know if you work with dreams, but oh, I think love dreams. That, yeah. Okay. So the <laughs> dreams are like, to me, they're, they're a gold mine of so much. So can I read you one person's story? Oh, yeah. Because I think it shows, kind of fits with the other people that I've kind of discussed. It's, it's not sweet. So I just start with that. So the father is like Hitler. This is the dream. The father is like Hitler. It's a current dream. It's not the current, maybe within the last five years. Okay. He had three daughters and one was suicidal. She is under his thumb. Myself and another sister cry as she will kill herself and he does not care. She is a poet. He trashes her work. She ate glass. He will not change. It's a pretty big dream. Mm -hmm. Why I also bring it up is it fits with Ingrid Yonker. Mm -hmm. who had similar. And, and a lot of the people I think that we deal with and again it the father is like Hitler would say are you going to admit how bad he is that he's evil and I think there are some fathers like that equally those oftentimes are the fathers who might look present and they're brutal in their verbal uh, talk in their actions even in their posture. And they are exactly like this and they cut down and don't honor the creativity of the daughter. In that, I wonder that they're not very envious of the life force of the daughter and that this is what's been going on for generations as well. This kind of push down of the feminine so the father won't be threatened. You mentioned Klein, envy, the, the, the power of it that to kill, uh, it can also be used in a positive way, but in this respect, it's one that kills. So I think that we see that in people's dreams and that hopefully they have better father figures over time through the analytic work, but it doesn't always start out very easy. Was there anything else you wanted to mention that we didn't get to? I think we've been, I think we've been good, don't you? Yeah, it's wonderful to chat with you. Yes, mm. you too. And I want to say you were so open to accept me. I looked at 
um, the different people that you had interviewed. And I thought how interesting to go into so many different areas and expand and be open and put it out for other people to learn from as well. Yeah, exactly. I found, I really tried to like, um, like give talks at different places like museums and stuff about art and like go into other areas to kind of bring psychoanalysis to other kinds of fields. And that way I get people from outside psychoanalysis exposed to psychoanalytic thinking kind of without realizing they're going to be. Because <laughs> I think we need more of it in the world. <laughs> I think you're right. But let me also just add that I think that, the, that what you said about art, I mean, the other thing we could say is sometimes from the pain and the distress and the stress comes amazing art and creativity and literature. Uh, I mean, it's, that's the other side that the pain actually gives birth to really an intense outpouring that is very valuable. And when you say about psychoanalysis, I also think it is important that the different psychoanalytic viewpoints find a way to talk to each other mm -hmm. and understand that they all have uh, blind spots and they all have something to contribute. So I think that's what you're doing as well, which is which can only help our world. Yeah, that's no, a really good point. That's what the, that's yeah. One of my goals is that. Uh, talking from all different kinds of theories and different practices and worldviews um, because yeah, I got really tired. Like in New York, there's so, when I lived in New York for like the last 10 years, I was in the States and um, in New York, there's so many different psychoanalytic institutes. There's like 50 and, and nobody from any of them talk to each other. You know, it's like everyone's in their little camps and I just found it so insane. And, and we kind of started a group in New York where we are like, inviting different people we knew from different places and trying to get everyone together to talk because there's so been so much like arguing and like parsing apart the different theories or who's right about this and that or well that doesn't make sense because so and so said this and I'm much more interested in like taking what's useful from everyone and like you said they all have blind spots and they all have things that are useful about them and why not just focus on what's useful instead of always picking apart at like what's not. I agree with you, but it also, I think that maybe we've been raised in this kind of uh, a linear father tr tradition where you stay within this language. I also think, because I'm interested in Kristeva and Judith Butler and all kinds of other people from different areas. Mm -hmm. And I think if we stay too narrow, then we are limiting ourselves. And then we're back in some old father tradition, patriarchal, which says do it one way rather than a broader, more creative putting together of pieces of, that's what the psyche is anyway. So that's what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. that's actually it's like a collage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've done it too. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so anytime you want to come back to, you're always welcome to get in touch. Or if you have any colleagues or friends that you think would like to do it, you know, feel free. That It's all like word of mouth. I just have people um, refer people that you think would like it, you know, to keep it more and more eclectic. So it's not just people I know personally, you know. Well, thank you. And, you know, I will keep that in mind. And I might contact you again as well. Absolutely. I've, I've so enjoyed your openness and the flow of it and uh thank you very much so yes i definitely will take very seriously what you said for sure good good yeah and you don't have to have a book or anything coming out if you have just something you're thinking about or want to talk about or an event coming up or anything like that you can always get in touch well thank you um let's hope that the world stays as open as you are <laughs> maybe, maybe there's a chance that the human race will survive <laughs> it's possible i hope so <laughs> we'll, see. we'll see it's we'll rocky see. right now <laughs> i know it is i know it's a little weird it's a little but you know what else i think and this fits also with this i do think that out of the destructiveness there always is that creation 
that we have no clue what it will be. And to me, there's, there's where the hope is. Yeah, exactly. And things have to break down and break apart for things to be built together in a better way. And that's why also I have a lot of friends that are like shamanic practitioners and things like that. And I always turn to them when I'm feeling depressed, because sometimes talking to the analysts will get you more depressed. (laughs) Because sometimes we're like, well, it's not really resolvable, especially if you're talking to like Lacanians, you know, they're like, well, it's not really resolvable, like the human neurosis or anything else. (laughs) So I always go to my shamanic friends who are much more like, no, Mother Earth is giving us a message and we have to listen to her and like take better care of her and take better care of each other and ourselves. And I'm like, yes, yes. Okay. I feel better again. (laughs) Because, you know, I, I do think that that circle of destruction leads to creation. It's in all the mythologies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's also in our bodies that, you know, that as we kind of change, we're also, we can certainly stay vibrant and creative and okay, this is different, but it doesn't mean it's bad different. And it doesn't mean, okay, that's it. End of story. No. Yeah. It could be opening up all sorts of other avenues and ways of working and being in the world. Totally. Absolutely. So thank you. Thank you. (laughs) It's been delightful. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Dr. Susan Schwartz. For more, visit her website, susanschwartzphd.com. You can visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net, or the podcast main website, renderingunconscious.org, for links and more information. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at rawsin underscore. That's R-A-W-S-I-N underscore. And now the song, Dark Moon, from the album Cut to Fit the Mouth a collaboration I did with Carl Abrahamson, available digitally at Highbrow Low Life's Bandcamp page. That's highbrowlowlife.bandcamp.com and as a limited edition CD box and cassette, available from Trapart Editions. Just visit Trapart's website, T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. Enjoy. Recorded on the new moon, June 3rd, 2016. My lunar module could never rest. Take me to the moon. The dark side of the moon, yeah, temporarily in is Lilith. And I bring to you, despised, and I seek your moment of freedom. Were spare developed an idiocut creative space habit right there as soon as the knowledge by leaving the child fly to UK to sign books return home from UK Brian Geisen and William S his works however the definition connective tissue as the skin limbs and divination proved was not that very be with you no or not no of laboring feel of laboring feet no or not no be with you 
fairy that was not proved in divination as the skin limbs, connective tissue, definition his works, however, the Brian Geisen and William S. Return home from UK, fly to UK to sign books, knowledge by leaving the child, have it right there, as soon as this spare created an idiosyncratic space, were moment of freedom, despised, and I seek your, is Lilith, and I bring to you, temporarily in the dark side of the moon, yeah, take me to the moon, my lunar module could never rest,